So we've got not a lot of time and six pages to get through. So I suggest, no. It's six pages because I like to write things out in full, but I won't hopefully use all of them. I want to start by asking you a very uh, simple question this morning, which is, if someone was to burst through those doors right now, and, you know, it was an, an armed soldier to say that you can no longer have church, you know, would we be ready to stand up and fight against a load of armed soldiers coming in and stopping us doing church? don't know about you, but I'm not wearing any body armor. I've not got any weapons. I'm not pretty much not ready to go into a battle. You know, right now that's what people are facing all across the world. And, you know, thank goodness in the UK we don't physically need to be ready to stand and defend ourselves in church, in the physical. But what about the spiritual? You know, right now, are you battle ready? You know, we've heard Pastor Rob say several times, you know, there's a war going on that we're seeing on our televisions every single day, but there's a war going on around us 24-7. There's a war going on in Eastbourne for the hearts and souls of people to come and encounter Jesus. And so we've got to ask ourselves, as people who profess to know Jesus Christ and be part of his army, are we battle ready? You know, when we think about maybe battle and and what that means in in terms of being a Christian, most of us will probably go straight away to Ephesians 6 and the armour of God. And that's where we're going to start this morning. So we're going to look at Ephesians 6, verses 10 to 20. Very well-known scriptures. And it says, A final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all the armour of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but we fight against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armour so you may be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then, after the battle, you will be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armour of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news, so that you will be able, that you'll be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the, the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on your salvation as a helmet. Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayer for all believers everywhere. I'm just going to leave it there for the sake of time. Now, when you read the armor of God, what's the first picture that comes to mind? What's the first thing that comes to mind? Most people, it will probably be a Roman soldier. Julie, if we can show that first image. I remember growing up, going through Sunday school, you probably got shown an image a bit like this. Happy chappy, looking good. You know, he's got his, got his breastplate on, he's got his shield, he's got his sword. Looks like a good chap. You know, and that was, that was the image that Paul used. At the time, there were Roman soldiers wandering around where they were in, in, in the regions of wherever they stayed dressed like this. But how many of you know this image isn't that relevant to us today? It would have been to about the mid-19th century. You know, mid-19th century battlefield wars were about shields, were about swords, were about, you know, kind of how battlefield went. But in today's day and age, modern advances of warfare, it's pretty unrelatable, this image. And as often this is evidenced by the fact that many Christians in their dialogue pretty irrelevant about the armor of God. You know, it's become a Christianese to talk about the armor of God, but the reality of the truth behind what the armor of God is often gets missed. You know, in order to make these truths relevant, I think we need to update our imagery to reflect a modern soldier. Subjective, I know, and you know, give me a bit of license here to be a bit creative where we're going to go, but we need to be able to associate with the power and the truths of the armor of God. You know, our mission as a Christian is to war alongside Jesus, to save souls, redeem what's been corrupted. And in order to do so successfully, we must absolutely know the weight of the whole armor of God that's upon our shoulders and in our hands. You know, take a step back for a minute and you look at the words you've got there, righteousness, truth, spirit, faith. You know, powerful, powerful things. They're radical. They're immeasurable gifts that were purchased for us by God and his son dying on the cross. But we've got to be able to comprehend it. It is our duty to do so. So if you joined the armed forces today, um, 
and you know you went and you started basic training, whatever service you went to, the first thing you'd do is be issued a load of kit. And today I'm going to use that word kit kind of interchangeably with the word armor as we see in scripture to try and help us bring a bit more of a modern picture of the armor of God. So Julia, if we can show that second picture. This is today what a modern soldier will look like. You know, slightly different to our happy chappy Roman soldier. You know, again, but you've got the basic elements. You've got a helmet at the top. This guy has also got a night vision on his helmet. He's got a weapon, you know, in this sense, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a rifle. Um, it's moved away from a sword. He's got body armor, which you can't see, which will be on his chest. He's got a belt, which is this webbing, which goes around him, which has all of his armor, has his ammo, has his, you know, nutrition, his hydration. You know, he's got med packs so he can save someone else. He's got his boots on. You know, so he's got all the elements there that we can picture that Paul was talking about. So, you know, this guy I can connect with. You know, it's a little bit more helpful for me because I've served in the military and I've had and worn all of this kit myself. But it's important that we can associate the armour of God. You know, this kit, what does it do? Our kit serves a dual role. This setup is to defend and go on the offensive. Yeah. You know, no soldier puts on full battle gear to stand in the middle of a field and try and defend a bit of field. He wants to go on the offensive. You know, basic soldiering is going on the offensive. Trust me, no soldiers like to stand and defend. They always want to be out taking offensive grounds. So the kit's purpose is to ensure we can withstand the rigour and dangers of the battlefield as we press on towards our objective. No modern warrior, as I said, has ever put on his kit to simply go and stand in enemy held territory and catch bullets in his chest. It's not what they do. You know, when the kit is put on, a modern warrior is filled with confidence, ready to go and confront the enemy, sometimes violently overwhelm the enemy. He's, he's ready. He is battle ready to go and take when the, what the enemy forces come against him. And we should have the same confidence yeah. In the armour of God. It's meant to produce in the hearts and minds of God's people this confidence that we can go and take ground that the enemy has taken yeah, from us. Yeah. But how many of us sometimes feel weak? You know, we don't really get the concept. We don't feel like we're going on the offensive. We feel like we are literally standing there trying to hold the small piece of ground that God has given us, constantly being pushed back. You know, it's your kit that allows you to offensively take, take or retake enemy strongholds. It's our kit that gives us the confidence to be the first man, to be the point man as you kick down a door. Our kit carries the tools that we need to destroy the enemy, to tend those that are wounded around us, that fall along the battle side. It carries the communications. You, won't, you can't see it in this image, but just the other side, he's got a radio on. He's got communications with his troop commander. He can hear the, the advice, the tactics of where he's going. It allows him to communicate with those that are overseeing. He's got his night vision, so he can see the enemy even in the darkest times. You know, it has our attachments for carrying food and water. It's the refreshment that you constantly need during arduous battle. It holds your map so you can correctly navigate rubble-filled streets. It's got your boots so you can stand firm across rocky terrain, rocky territory. And your helmet gives you the assurance that, of protection that you can charge alongside your, your fellow brothers and sisters into chaos. Your weapon serves only one purpose, just as a double-edged sword, and that's to inflict harm on somebody who's trying to attack you. You know, you, typically soldiers do not carry guns as a little nice thing, as a novelty. They're there to create harm in the right situation when needed. Now, it's the same as the sword which Paul talks about. Too often Christians see that sword as, oh, I, I couldn't use that. No, we're told to use it. It is an offensive weapon. A sword is not a defensive weapon. It's offensive. We've got to take it into battle. You know, a modern... Modern combat armor is built in such a way that it defends. You know, these breastplates that they wear, the bulletproof ones, they can withstand a number of rounds and to offend their kind of core parts. Same as the armor that God has given us. You know, can you see the parallels between what Paul was saying and what a modern soldier is wearing? You know, the armor of God is so much more than we have ever been led at times to understand. It's more than merely protection. You know, it should be the very essence of the Christian life which is going forward and taking that which the enemy wants to take away from us you know it requires us to be battle ready you know no sane person would walk on to a war-torn street in a pair of flip-flops and shorts holding their iphone thumbing through a devotional to try and find what god says about them to try and give them protection 
You know, if you're in the middle of a battlefield, you want more than you're holding up your iPhone. But, but my iPhone says this about me. But for many Christians, that's how we do battle. You know, we find ourselves unprepared, ill-equipped, and we're thumbing through our phones trying to find, oh, I know there's a scripture somewhere. Well, my pastor said this to me once, but we don't hold the reality of the truth that we already have this armor given to us to go on the offensive. You know, we're not battle ready if we're just quickly looking for that. You know, and this morning, I want to give you three bits of advice that I learned during my time, my service in the military, that can help us become battle ready. I'm not going to go too much into the individual elements of the armour of God. I think there's so much you can find out there, and I want you to go and read it for yourself. But I'm going to give you some things around what we used to do in military service that could help us be battle ready. And hopefully this will help you in your journey. And the first thing we've got to do, point number one, is we've got to stay alert. You know, for me personally, I found one of the most vulnerable times in my life is straight after a victory. Straight after you've come through and feel like you've won, typically you're at the most vulnerable. You know, I remember a time, so just for for context, I spent six and a half years serving in the Royal Navy as a medic. Um, I Thankfully, I never had to serve overseas in a conflict, but I spent a lot of time on Dartmoor soldiery playing, doing exercises, playing soldiers, as you'd call it, but they feel quite real. So a lot of this experience is drawn from my time of doing that. I also spent time um, serving at CTCRM, which is where the Royal Marines train as part of their training. So I've seen how they train. I also spent time at Dartmouth, which is where the officers train. So I think I was at the time of my service, I was the only person at my rank to serve at all three training centres that the Navy have. So I've kind of seen a, a perspective of how things are trained. So this is where this experience is coming from. And I remember one time I was on Dartmoor. I was doing an exercise with a a group of Royal Marines that were going through training and I was there. I was the troop medic, so I was embedded as part of them as the troop medic. And, you know, we've been given a duty. We were to, we'd made a harbour position, so that was our base camp. And in the middle of the night, we'd gone and we'd, we'd, there was an enemy house we were going to go and take. So we'd spent our time, we'd stalked it out all day. We knew their movements, we'd assessed it. And that night we went and attacked their house. We took it, you know, the guys went in pretty violently, kicked down doors, you know, took over what was the hunter troop at the time. They were our pretend enemies. And we thought we did well. We, we, we achieved our objective. We were set. So then we, you know, we were bumbling back up to camp, up to our harbour place, you know, pretty, pretty stoked, full of adrenaline, you know, kind of chatting as you do, doing, a bit, a bit of banter going on between the lads. And we were kind of just getting ready to bed down for the night. And suddenly a couple of flashbangs hit our camp and we were being attacked by a different enemy that none of us knew was out there. The lesson we learn there is just because we've won a victory and we think we've achieved our objective is we need to always be alert. When we'd got back to camp, what we were supposed to do was put a number of guys on duty, on stag duty around the camp, constantly looking out to make sure that there was nobody else coming to get us, no revenge troops on the way. But we hadn't, we'd all just rushed in, you know, got our mess tins open, was cooking up our food because it had been a cold night and we had nobody on duty. And therefore we were overwhelmed by the enemy. You know, they, in that time we lost our objective. You know, we must stay alert, especially after a hard battle when you feel drained and spent because it's one of your most vulnerable times. You know, I find, and I, I don't know, Rob feels the same, but often after preaching, you kind of feel pretty spent. And, you know, Sunday afternoons is the afternoon where you kind of get that little whisper in your head of, oh, you should have said that. Oh, you could have said that. Or, you know, suddenly some, just something comes in from a left field. You think, where the heck has that come from? Because, you know, Satan hates the gospel being preached. So that's the way he attacks there. But in our lives, if you've been for a battle and you feel like you've achieved the victory, you've got to stay alert. You know, what does verse 18 of Ephesians 6 say? It says, pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. Stay alert and be persistent. Too often as Christians, we see the victory. We think we've achieved the objective that we had and we stand down. But God may have something something else going on. There may be another attack coming. I'm not saying that's always the case. So we've got to stay alert. One way we stay battle ready is being alert at all times. Now that doesn't mean you live in a heightened state of readiness. It doesn't mean you're constantly like fight or flight, like what's going on, you know. It's just being aware. You know, for us that meant we put people on duty, three hours on, three hours off. Just being aware. That's the normal basic routines of soldiering. It's the same for a Christian. It just means you go back to your normal routine, you know, your daily devotion, your prayer time. It means you don't think, oh, I can relax now. God, you've got that victory. I'm going to take a little holiday of prayer. I'm going to take a little holiday of reading my Bible. Just go back to doing the things you do. 
back to your basic soldiering, to use a, a term like that. So point number one is we've got to stay alert. Point number two is we've got to ensure that our kit fits. When I joined my last unit, um, which was Commander Logistics Regiment in North Devon, I joined and I had been told by my last place that when I got there, I was going to get issued a load more new uniform. So my last unit had been an, an, a pure Navy unit, so I wore kind of Navy blues uniform, as you'll see guys on ships wear. But I was going to a commander unit where it was the kind of camo gear that you saw there. But I didn't have any of that camo gear. But I was assured by my storeman at my last base that they'll sort you out when you get there. Well, that was not the truth of the matter. <laughs> I arrived day one at my new unit not having the right uniform. And thankfully, I went and saw the chief, and he managed to kind of talk to a couple of the other guys, and they gave me some kit to wear until they could get a new delivery in the stores. Now, the problem was, this guy was not the same size as me. He was taller and thinner. So, man, this kit was not comfortable to wear. Putting on the belt was like... I spent all day kind of feeling very uncomfortable. As soon as I got home, I was like, oh, relax, relax. Abby will testify. That's what so for about two and a half weeks, I was wearing this wrong kit you know and when I finally did get my kit oh man it was a relief because it fitted properly I was able to have a belt I could adjust and do up the right way I didn't constantly feel like I was on edge and that if someone asked me to breathe out I was going to ping and hit them with a button and they needed to be wearing a weapon uh, some defense themselves but also with our kit when you join the military you get given kit and it's your own you know your webbing that you saw there the pouches you know they've got millions of adjustments that you adjust for yourself you know, if I was to pick up one of my oppos, um, one of my buddies' webbing and put it on, it wouldn't fit me properly. You know, it might be a bit loose here or a bit tight there because we're each individuals are meant to have our own armour. You know, and we see a story similar to this in the Old Testament. You know, in the book of 1 Samuel, we're going to look at 1 Samuel 17, 38 to 40. And, you know, we all know the story of David and Goliath. But this is the moments before David's come. He's volunteered to go and fight Goliath. And Saul's like, oh, happy days. Someone's going to go and fight him for me. But he's like, feeling a little bit bad. Thinks, well, I might want to give this guy a bit of armor. You know, he's just a little, little shepherd boy. You know, I might want to give him a little bit of protection. You know, his, dad, his dad's going to come with some lawsuit that I sent him out there by himself. So Saul decided to give David his armor. So we'll read here. Then Saul gave David his own armor, a bronze helmet and a coat of mail. David put it on, strapped the sword over it, and took one step or two to see what it was like, for he had never worn such things before. I can't go in these, he protested to Saul. I'm not used to them. So David took them off again. He picked up five smooth stones from a stream and put them in his shepherd's bag. Then armed with only a shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. You know, David tried on someone else's armour, but realised he couldn't move. So he went to what he knew. He went and picked up his armour. Now, most of us look at that story and think that's crazy, but he used what he knew how to use. You know, when it comes to our kit, our armour, you know, putting on our armour of God, you've got to make sure it's your own. There's too many Christians going into battles today wearing soul's armour, metaphorically. They're running on someone else's truth, someone else's faith, and then wondering why they're not winning. If you go into battle and you come up against the enemy, and you, you, maybe you're dealing with some stuff in your head, and all you're saying is, Pastor Rob said this, Pastor Rob says that, he's going to go, so? What do you believe? Yeah. What do you believe? Where's your truth? Yeah. Where's your faith? What are yeah. you standing on? We cannot go into battle wearing someone else's armor. And it's even more important when it comes to our weapon, to that word of God, the truth. Yeah. You know, in the military, when you get issued a weapon, you spend some time as you get issued a weapon on the range in a process of what's called zeroing it, learning to make the little adjustments for how you shoot, how your eyesight is, so you can hit that target. So each soldier has a weapon zeroed to themselves. You know, in my last unit, I had my own weapon. That was my number. That was my weapon. It was my responsibility. If I suddenly picked up someone else's weapon and started trying to fire down range, I'd find that I would miss because although I'm aiming at the target, they might have it set up slightly differently because their, their truth and what they need was slightly different yeah. to mine. Yeah. And, you know, on a, on a training range, I could have probably made some adjustments, could have at a time worked out, okay, maybe it was veering to the right, so I'd make the adjustments myself to go, to go a little bit left to get that shot on. But who knows, in the midst of a battle, you don't have time to be making minor adjustments yeah. like that. Yeah. You need to fight. Yeah. So that's why it's so important that we've got our own weapons. This is why... It's so important that we're getting into the word for ourselves. You know, if the only time that you hear the word of God is on a Sunday morning, you know, when it comes to a battle scenario, you are using someone else's weapon. 
You've got to get into study, meditating, asking questions of God in your own time with the Word. You know, you might hear something here on a Sunday morning from whoever's preaching. Take it away that week. Ask some questions about it. Go, God, do I, do, do I agree with what that says? You know, we encourage you to test what we are saying for yourselves. You know, we're all learning. We're all on journeys ourselves. You know, Pastor Rob talks so much about his time in the commentaries and learning and stuff. Such an encouragement for us as a church that, you know, we've got a pastor that's constantly looking to love and learn more about the Word of God because that is our sole offensive weapon, is the Word of God, the spirit of truth. That is our absolute authority when it comes to truth. So we need to make sure that we have our own kit, that you've got your own weapon, that it's zeroed in for you. So when you pick it up and you put it to your eye and you've got that enemy in your iron sights, you know you're going to hit him first shot. You know you can take him down with one or two shots because you're not worried about a bullet pinging there, pinging there, because you know you're zeroed in on the truth that you know that's inside you, that you know that you know that you know that you are a child of God, that you know that you know that your God says you are healed, that you are restored, that you are made whole. But if you only know that because you've heard me say it or Pastor Rob says it, your bullets are going to go veering off. They're going to miss. The enemy's just going to go, ah, step aside. Ah, where are you going? We've got to know for ourselves, in ourselves. So number two, ensure your kit fits. And finally, number three, is don't neglect kit maintenance. There was one occasion during my basic training, and we had been... We'd done something wrong, so that night we got punished, and we were made to go and run through some very muddy and horrible stuff that night. And when we got back, it was about 2 a.m., and you know, we were told, right, you need to square away your kit, sort it out for the morning, and then get some sleep. And I'd looked at the plans for the next day, because uh, in, in the military, in, in basic training, basically, we had orders that come out, which would tell you what you're doing every moment of every single day and what kit to wear. And I'd looked at that for the next day and thought, oh, I see that I don't need that kit tomorrow. That's fine. I'm not going to worry about that kit. I'm just going to bung it at the back of my locker and I'll deal with it tomorrow night when I know I've got a lot more time to deal with it. So I and a couple of others in my troop decided we were going to get some kit. We thought sleep was more important. Got up in the morning, I was feeling good, feeling good about myself, feeling a little bit probably cocky, a bit, a bit kind of feel like, yes, I, I've got head, I've got some sleep. Because the other guy was like, man, we didn't get to bed till 4 a.m. And, you know, the alarm clock went off at 5.30 for us to get up, get ready to, for breakfast. And then suddenly that afternoon, one o'clock in the afternoon, our, our chief comes in and goes, change your plan. We're going to do the assault course. <laughs> oh, man, my heart sank. I was like, oh, no, I know what the assault course means. The assault course means that kit, which is wet, muddy, and smelly at the back of my locker, needs to be put back on. Not only is it wet, smelly, and muddy, which putting kit on, which is wet, smelly, and muddy, is horrible in itself. And there's a whole other thing we can talk about, about wet, dry routine that they have to do. But I'm going to stand out because everyone else is going to have clean, lovely uniform on. You know, we wore white T-shirts at the time that we had to hand clean with scrubbing brushes. There was no washing machines during basic training. I am going to stand out like a sore thumb here. So I did, went back in, put my kit on, stood there at parade. And man alive, did I get absolutely beasted. They did, my troop did one lap of this up course. I did three. <coughs> I then, that evening, instead of having the evening off, had to, at various points of the evening, go and present myself in various different kits to stand and they look at my kit. Yep, that's nice and clean. Take it off in an hour's time, we want to see you in another kit, knowing full well that then I had to go and clean all that kit I've just worn to get it ready for the morning for a kit muster. I learned a valuable lesson about kit maintenance. You know, one of the things we were taught to do is make sure that our kit is always ready. You know, in the military, we even had things, we had a, what we called a make amend afternoon, where, you know, we were encouraged to go and just check all our kit, and if there's any problems with it, either repair it or go to the stores and get it replaced. You know, and this is especially important when it comes to exercises and in operational theatres. You know, when it comes to war zones, it can be the difference between life and death. You know, imagine this, picture this. You've been on a six-hour patrol in Helmand province in Afghanistan. You know, during that patrol, you and your troop have maybe got into several firefights with, with the enemy. You know, during one such fight, several of the troop took rounds, including yourself. Most were protected by your body armor, and there's only a flu few flesh wounds. You arrive back at your full operation, operating base, known as a FOB. You're tired, you're hungry, and you're hurting after that patrol. All you want to do is have some food 
and get some sleep, especially when you know in a few hours' time you're up again because it's your turn on duty. You know, however, you know that before you can do any of that, before you can get some food, before you can get some sleep, you need to service your weapon. You need to strip it down, clean it, re-ammo it so that it's ready to go. You know, you need to clean our kit, check it for damage. You need to replace your body armor. You know, and after that, then, you know, we can maybe get a new helmet. Then you go for some food and get some sleep. You know, why is that important? Because on the front line, as I said, you don't know when your next battle is. You don't know. Just because you're in your forward operating base, the enemy doesn't know that. They're going to come for you. They're going to come and take you where you are. It's not always offensive. Sometimes we are on the defense. You know, you may be hoping that tomorrow you have a light day, chilled out, but the enemy may have other plans. You could get called to go and support another troop who's in the middle of a firefight. You could suddenly be a reconnaissance troop going out to support someone else. And if you get that call in the middle of the night and you haven't serviced your weapon, you know, you haven't restocked your ammo, you haven't replaced your body armor that got hit, you haven't checked your kit, you're going to go out there into battle with potentially a weapon that's going to misfire or run out of ammo. And then you take on rounds. Your body armor's already hit. You take on rounds, so therefore you become a casualty. Therefore, then they need to send another troop out to rescue you while someone else goes and rescues the troop that you were supposed to be looking after. A simple thing of getting back and making sure your kit is good and is well-maintained can be the difference between life and death. And it's the same when we do spiritual battle with the enemies around us. You know, every time you go into battle against the enemy, your armor is going to take a dent, is going to take damage. That's his purpose. But too many Christians whip it off, put it down, metaphorically speaking, and the next day put it back on. But they don't check to think, oh, actually, there's a crack there. I need to repair that. Or there's some damage there. Maybe I need to, you know, if we're, if we're talking physical armor like the Roman soldier, you know, take it to the, to the armor and he'll knock it out and give it a clean, maybe patch it up. You know, we need to service our weapons. That's getting back into the word of God. Yeah. Now, again, just because you've had a battle, you've been for a time, doesn't, it's not your time to put the word of God down. It's your time to get it even sharper than where it was before. We need to restock our ammo. You know, for me, that's meditating on the scriptures. It's not just reading new stuff. It's just going over the stuff that you know. Just get it seated deeper and deeper inside of us. Check our armor. How do you check your armor? Keep short accounts with God and others. One of the ways to keep your armor on check is to keep short accounts with others. And then build up your faith by recalling what God has already done for you yeah. in the past. That's how you knock your armor into place. That's how you deal with the dents in your armor, is you recall what God has done for you. And if you run out of things God's done to you, listen into a prayer meeting, and then you'll start hearing what God is doing in this church. And that, again, will build your faith. Come and spend time with a connect group. Get ways to get your faith built up. Firstly, through what God has done in your life, but then by hearing what he's doing in other people's lives, because that will encourage you and help you grow your faith. And the final thing we always used to do is check and clean our boots. You know, why are boots important? Boots, they talk about, is the gospel of peace. Is peace. Peace is so important. You know, Bill Johnson said this. He said, when God creates peace, it's based on the presence of a person called the Prince of Peace. That peace also has a military effect. And the God of peace will crush Satan underneath your feet. Romans 16, 20. Outside of the kingdom of God, peace is the absence of something. Most people in the world, when you say to peace, they assume it's the absence of war, conflict, things like that. But actually, inside the kingdom, it's not the absence of something, it's the presence of a person. It's the presence of Jesus Christ. We've got to make sure that Jesus and the gospel is ever present in every single area of our lives. That is our boots. That's the things that hold you up. That's the thing that keep your ankles safe when you're crossing over rocky terrain. That's the things that allow you to scale mountains. It allows you to run through the Arctic. You know, there's Arctic warfare that goes on and you get special boots issued for that. You know, our boots are the thing that we need to be making sure they're in good condition because it's easy to neglect them. You know, how many of you take your shoes off at home and don't even bother to look to see if there's any a pin stuck in the bottom of them? You know, anything like that? I know for a fact there's a pin stuck in one of my flip-flops at home. It's been there for about a couple of weeks and I haven't bothered to take it out yet. You know, that's just a flip-flop. But when it comes to our boots of the gospel, we've got to make sure they are in good order. To end, you know, as I said, there is a war going on around us 24-7. You know, we can try to ignore it or we can face it head on. We can get ourselves battle ready to stand shoulder to shoulder with our brothers and sisters in God's army and take the fight to the enemy. You know, the reality is every single choice of truth is an act of war in a world where truth has become relative. 
You know, how many of you have heard people say, well, that's just your truth? No, we have truth. Truth is the word of God. So every time we speak truth from the word of God, it is an act of war against a world that wants to change the definition of many things around us. Every act of love, every random act of kindness is a round that's fired down the range. Each note played or word sung in worship is an artillery round impacting enemy territory. Every time a brother or sister admits a weakness to a fellow brother or sister who then ministers to that brother in compassion, it's a nighttime raid on the enemy. You know, for the peace and joy set before us, we need to put on our kit. We need to get battle ready and we need to take hold of the things that Christ has already taken for us. You know, Christ has already won the victory. So we're putting on kit. It's like an exercise in reality. The difference between war and exercise in the military is an exercise, as you know, there is an end point. You already know the outcome because you're going to keep doing it until you get the end, the outcome. You know, I've been on many exercises where we repeated the same thing over and over and over again until we got it right. You know, we know Jesus has the victory. The war is real around us, but we know the outcome. Therefore, that gives us even more confidence as we don our kits and get ready to go and fight. You know, We've got to believe that we are in the army of the Most High. Jesus is our general, but unlike generals today that sit back in very safe places and call in orders, he's there on the front lines with us. He's there standing shoulder to shoulder with us. And we put on our kit, our armor of God, and we acknowledge the overwhelming victory of Christ in us. And we get ready to kick down doors for the kingdom, for the hearts and the homes of those around us. You know, for the 90,000 people in Eastbourne that do not know Jesus Christ, we become battle ready are you battle ready this morning take a moment to think about that are you ready for battle if you walk out of this door this morning and suddenly you know you start having thoughts in your head about something something challenges you are you battle ready to defend that with the truth have you got your shield of faith ready just to defend it away your body armor on ready to go into battle is your weapon zeroed ready to go and take it to the enemy we've got to become battle ready so I encourage you this week, have a think about it. You know, for me, it, it made it a lot easier when I started to think about the armor of God to have that modern picture because it was so much more relatable to me. Yeah. But, you know, find something that you can relate to. You know, if you're into sports, you know, maybe think about the sports kit people would wear. You can make analogies to make it relatable for you. It's not going beyond the Bible. It's just making it in a context that you understand. You know, if you play football, you know, you've got your shin pads, you've got your boots, you know, there's various different things you can kind of analogies you can draw to help you understand the armor of God, because the truth revealed in that is so, so powerful. We've just got to grab a hold of it. As I said, I do not want us running around on war-torn streets, thumbing for our iPhones in shorts and flip-flops. You know, we need to be soldiers of the, of the mighty high's army, ready to go. Sometimes that's defending, that's standing, protecting a brother and sister who's injured, who's down as someone treats them. Sometimes that's going on the offensive. Sometimes you will have periods where you're just in your operating base, looking out, just staying alert, just watching. Nothing going on around you every now and then. You might see someone pop their head up. But, you know, there'd be periods where you do that. But we've got to be prepared. So I'm going to remind you of them three points. Number one, stay alert. Pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. Number two, ensure your kit fits. Have a think. You know, some of the truths that you know, make sure they're your truth. Make sure it's your faith you're running on, your victories you've got behind you. And number three is don't neglect your kit maintenance. When you've been through a hard time, first thing you need to do is check your kit is ready because you don't know when that next time you're going to need it is coming. You know, if anyone ever promised you that coming to church and becoming a Christian meant all hard times go away, I'd go and get them and have a brief conversation with them about how that is not true. And maybe they need to think about what Jesus they follow. Because Jesus doesn't tell us that we're going to have a time of perfect harmony, singing kumbaya on the world until he comes back. He tells us we're in a war. We're on a battleground for the hearts and minds of those around us. But he says, I'm with you always. I am the Prince of Peace. My presence brings peace into every situation. But we've got to at times be ready to don our kit and go and fight. We're going to have to fire some rounds. We're going to have to be willing to maybe take the odd blow as we go on the offensive. But he's with us. He wants us to make sure our kit is always prepared. So let's stand. I'm just going to pray quickly and then we'll we'll end here. Father God, we just thank you 
for the armor of God that you have given us, Lord God. Thank you for the truths that we find in Ephesians 6, Lord God, of the things you've given us to help us in our warfare. You've not left us unaided. You've not, you've not left us just dumped in the middle of a war ground and said, right, make your way. No, you've given us the skills. You've given us the things to wear, Lord God. And help us this week as we meditate on what it means to put on the various elements of the armor of God. Help us this week to be battle ready. Lord God, if we need to stay alert, if we need to be more conscious of times to stay alert, Lord God, help us to be aware of that. Lord God, if we need to make sure our kit fits this week, Lord God, do some kit maintenance and some kit checking with us this week. Let us search deeper for our own truth. Let us check our own faith deposits. You know, what has God done for me that I can build up my own faith with? And Lord God, help us to always be ready to do kit maintenance, to service our weapons, to get into the word of God, to make sure we have got our boots on, that Prince of Peace is going with us, Lord God, and that your presence is ever known in every situation we go into. God, help us to be ready, to be battle ready, to stand shoulder to shoulder in the army of God, a Suncoast church here, to be ready to face whatever is coming. That we're not just going to defend the ground here we've got today, but we want to take more and more of enemy strongholds across Eastbourne. There is 90,000 people out there that need to know you, Lord God. And today, God, we say we are battle ready. We are going to get battle ready to take the ground. Lord God, we are ready to stand with you and go into this war to see our friends, our neighbours, our families, our loved ones encounter the radical life-changing love, grace, mercy that you poured out for them that they can find through an encounter with you. So God, help us this week to be battle ready. Amen. Amen. You know, one of the things that I always found interesting